Hello, everybody. This is the Cincinnati Herald podcast. I am your host, John Alexander Reese, digital editor of the Cincinnati Herald. If you don't know the Cincinnati Herald, it's been around since 1955 and is the largest African-American newspaper in the greater Cincinnati area. And today I have some guests with me. First, I have our chief beauty consultant for the Cincinnati Herald, Morgan A. Owen. How are you doing today, Morgan? I'm great. How are you, John? I am doing fantastic. Then we have Herald writer, Tyra Gordon. How are you doing today, Tyra? Hey, John, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. And we have our intern, Suhana Sinhan. How are you doing today, Suhana? I'm doing fantastic, John. Thank you so much. And in addition to that, we have special guest, fashion designer, Asha Ama Bias Daniels. How are you doing today, Asha? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me on. How are you guys? We're all doing fantastic. Now, before we move on to our main topic, which is, you know, to interview you, we're doing, uh, we're going to cover some general news stories which happened uh, throughout the week. And our first story of the day is about Kim Janey. Boston has a new mayor in Kim Janey who makes history as the city's first female and first person of color to take the office. Marty Walsh resigned Monday evening to become President Joe Biden's labor secretary. The Boston City Council President Janey, who is Black, has stepped into the role of acting mayor and is scheduled to have a ceremonial swearing in on Wednesday. Tyra, what are your thoughts on this momentous occasion? John, I think it's excellent in reading up on Kim Janey. Um, she grew up in Boston. Um, to hear that 11 years at 11 years old, as a Black student, she was bused all over Boston um, to school to um, integrate schools and to have um, whites throwing rocks at her, um, calling her names. Um, so I, I read about that history and to uh, bring it fast forward to today as she's becoming the first female and first black mayor of Boston is very interesting. Um, just knowing about the racial tension and the racial history in Boston um, is interesting. Um, I did read where she said that she's not sure if she's going to run. She's acting um, for her predecessor. Um, but the, uh, the other candidates, mayoral candidates, are all uh, people of color. So it'll be interesting to see how it turns out um, come November. But I think it's very inspiring. It is very inspiring. Suhana, your thoughts on um, this very historic moment? So I feel very proud that uh, finally there is a black face in the leadership of Boston. And uh, many say that this is a moment that will go down in the history. Uh, I feel as a person in my young 20s uh, and with so much going on in the world, it is all, it's nice to see some positive changes and major impacts that are coming around in the world. So I think it's a very good moment and I'm very happy for Boston and, and representation for African-American community. Now, moving on to our second topic, which is Ohioans 16 and older can fill unused vaccination appointments over the next several days. Ohio clinics unable to fill their appointments for the COVID-19 vaccine can and should begin making exceptions to the state's current eligibility criteria, Governor Mike DeWine announced Monday. Although the Ohio Department of Health recommends vaccination only for people over the age of 40, DeWine said vaccine providers may immunize patients as young as 16 over the next six days. Tyra, your thoughts on this um, developing news story? I think it's good for those who want to get vaccinated. Me personally, I'm still unsure. I have a 17 year old daughter, so I'm not sure whether or not we will be vaccinated. We both have had COVID. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure where I stand on that personally, but as far as the availability for those who, who would like to get it and for those, you know, 16 years of age or older, um, because, you know, there are people under 40 who have pre-existing conditions that may cause them to have a high need for the vaccine, you know, if that's their choice. So, I mean, I think it's good for those who want to move forward with getting the vaccine. Definitely. Suhana, your thoughts? Well, uh, I think on the positive side, uh, younger pe people getting vaccinated 
makes the school more habit habitable because uh, teachers often have this complaint that they got vaccinated and going to classes, but they're not sure are children vaccinated or not or where they have been. So this, I think this allows teachers to feel a little more uh, relief that uh, their students might or might not be vaccinated, at least given the opportunity willing students would be uh, happy to get vaccinated. But at the same time, this actually highlights the a major concern in the community that why not enough adults are wanting to get vaccine. Uh, if I directly look into the African-American history, of the community, there if people I have spoken to, they have their reservations on getting vaccine in general. So opening the slots for younger people to get vaccine is a great on one side for this in for like progressing the society because we can't keep things closed for any longer. So people getting vaccinated would be a good initiative for like reopening things. But at the same time, it highlights very deeply how people have their reservations on getting vaccination. And, and if I must even say, the deep-rooted scars from racism are coming up play here because there is no direct racism associated with providing vaccine, but the history makes people reserved in taking it. And this is pretty much how I feel about it. I'm not sure how this can be tackled overnight, but uh, this is something we have to understand and accept and eventually wait that people might feel comfortable to come and fill those slots to take the vaccine. But until then, uh, it's great that they're not letting vaccines go to waste. Definitely. And our last um, news story of the day, um, unfortunately is 10 are dead in a Boulder, Colorado shooting. Ahmad Alyssa was identified by the authorities Tuesday as the gunman who opened fire at a grocery store in Colorado, killing 10 people, including a Boulder police officer. The name of the 21-year-old suspect who is in custody was released at a news conference by Boulder Police Chief Maris Harold, who did not disclose a possible motive for Monday's bloodshed. Tyra, your thoughts on this very tragic event? John, it's a sad story all around. They have not released a motive um, as for why this man did this. But I, I just feel like because he was on the FBI's radar, he was linked to someone else who was under investigation and his criminal record. I feel like this is something that could have possibly been prevented. His brother spoke to say that he um, was mentally ill um, and he suffered from depression. And, you know, he was known in high school as very, being very temperamental. So... I feel like the writing was on the wall. And just, again, especially with him being on the FBI's radar, I feel like it could have been prevented. And then just reading the stories of all the victims, employees of the grocery store, just residents of the area shopping, it's just sad. It is very sad. Suhana, your take on this new story? Um, John, I feel every time we call a suspected killer, somebody suffering from depression, is putting a bad name to people who are suffering with mental illnesses and they're taking treatment for it because uh, it's high time and with the number of shootings that we have, mass shootings and massacres that we have experienced in this last decade, it is uh, a, it's really astonishing and bad. And I think we should, uh, government and media should stop labeling it under the mental health condition that just because the person was suffering from depression, there was a sign that they could do something like this. Uh, this is a form of domestic terrorism, and uh, I don't know how many more people we need uh, need to see killed and dead and gone before we realize that their lives matter, and for God's sake, not let every person who does this be associated with just like, oh my God, they are having depression, or they are young, and they were misguided. Assault weapons being available so readily for somebody to use and do shooting. I mean, today we are talking about the Boulder incident and last two, three days ago, it was about uh, the shooting in Atlanta. It is just because there is no clear motive available for this gentleman for what he did. It doesn't uh, drive out that his in, what he did was absolutely malicious and I believe there should be no amount of uh, sympathy given to him. In the, in the court scrutiny and media scrutiny because this person is a murderer who took a full rifle to 
a grocery store and shot 10 people dead in a broad daylight. And I don't think he deserves any form of uh, my or anybody's sympathy, in my opinion. You're definitely right about that. And I also want to say it's really tragic to see. It seems like a mass shooting just happens uh, like several times a year. And I just hope we can get to a point where we can, you know, Congress and the House and everyone can just like find a common ground to just prevent all these shootings from happening because it, it's really, really tragic. Okay, so those are some of the news topics of the day. And now I want to hand it over to Morgan A. Owens, who is going to talk about fashion with our special guest today. So Morgan, go ahead. All right. Thank you, John. So again, my name is Morgan Angelique Owens. I am the chief creative beauty consultant for Harold Beauty. And what other person to interview the fabulous Asha, who I've known Oh gosh, I don't even know how many years when you came to um, my curvy cardio class. So this is very personal, very special to me to have this conversation with you. So I'm so excited to see you for one, um, but also catch up and hear about all the amazing stuff you have going on. So welcome again. Thank you. No, I, you guys didn't see, but when I hopped on and I saw that Morgan was interviewing me, I was like, yes, my homegirl, I've missed you. I've missed your classes. I missed you too. I was going to say, did you always envision yourself being a fashion designer? So oddly enough, there was always like, a, there were definitely breadcrumbs that I was supposed to be a fashion designer. Um, but going to school, I've always been someone who's very strong academically. And so because I got such good grades in class and I was such a little like annoying perfectionist, I always thought that I'd be something more traditional, um, like a lawyer, a doctor. And it took my high school year doing a design class with an amazing teacher who I love to this day, um, Allison Probst. She was my design teacher. And she was the first person that kind of gave me that aha moment that I was meant to be a fashion designer. But when I look back now, you know, I started hand sewing when I was like seven, something like that, like super early on. My mom was also a designer and a seamstress. Um, so started hand sewing really early, um, used to make clothes for my sister growing up, just never thought that I could have something so creative and fun. And that was my passion as an actual career. That is so dope. So what, um, since my question, what high school did you go to? And then what college did you go to? <laughs> yeah, um, I went to St. Ursula Academy. And for college, I went to the University of Cincinnati's DAP program. Awesome. Did you see, I'm curious to know, like, did you see a lot of women who look like you in your program? Not at all. In fact, that is, um, that's actually a topic that we'll be exploring in my residency. Um, but that's always been something that's dear to my heart is the fact that there are not enough of us to that have a seat at the table or even have the ability to make our own table. Mm -hmm. um, so as a black woman and as a black person, just in general, um, I've always advocated for more black students being um, given the tools to get a seat at DAP, um, to go to the places that I've interned at, to get the jobs that I've been able to get. Um, and I think that that's something that every black person, no matter what career you're in, should really um, take to heart to, like, I think a lot of times we think that we have to get to a certain level of success before we can pull someone else up. And one of the great things that my parents instilled in me is that you don't have to have it all figured out to pull someone else along with you. And um, yeah, so that's something that's always been important to me, but no, nowhere near enough diversity and specifically black and specifically black female voices in the fashion industry. And, you know, I, that surprises me in the fashion, but so the whole reasoning that I wanted to do Harold Beauty is because we don't see a lot of us, at, like you said, at the table. We see these marketing efforts and they're just, they miss the mark, right? But yet Black women have a billion dollars spent in fashion, in beauty, but we're often left out of the conversation that I think that's just so mind boggling that we don't get enough respect and the shine when we're bringing in all the dollars. Um, so that just, that, that definitely is needed. And I love, I love how you said, you know, you don't have to be at a certain level to lift as you climb. And that's always how I've um, operated as well. You know, I wanted Harold Beauty to be an opportunity to spotlight 
beauty businesses who aren't at maybe, you know, the, the crown, the, the crown box or, you know, um, the lip bar or in essence just yet. Um, so I absolutely agree with that, but, but yeah, the little girls are looking up to you, I'm sure. And tell me about, uh, your residency is it's at the Taft museum, correct? Yeah. So, um, actually to circle back to one of the things you said really quickly, um, your audio went out for a second. So sorry, I think I missed a little bit of what you said. Um, but not only do we have a huge spend in these industries, we also are the inspiration, you know, things that we've been doing for years are just now becoming popular and they're called boxer braids, you know, and it's like, those are cornrows. We've been wearing those since I was a kid and my mom was wearing those when she was a kid. So, um, and it goes further down than that. So yeah, I agree. Um, Black women to the front is definitely the movement for 2021. Um, but yeah, my residency is at the Taft Art Museum um, and it's a residency that's put on by the Duncanson Society. So Robert Duncanson is a Black artist whose work is actually on the walls of the Taft Art Museum. Um, he was so talented and I'm just really fortunate that I get to um, fill this residency for 2021 and I'm so excited about it. A lot of the work that we'll be doing through the programming will be focused on Black identity and um, of of course, and there will be a lot of focus on Black female identity. Yes, I love it. And I saw that you're doing some workshops with uh, younger girls. Look, I, I'm ready to take that, um, the crown workshop, okay? I know it says it's geared towards high school students, but I'm ready to make a crown. <laughs> yeah, girl, come through, honestly. Um, I, when I was interviewing for the residency, um, they were kind of like, what group of people do you feel most comfortable with? And just from my background and the experiences that I've had, I'm comfortable with any and everybody. So if you wanna come through to the Crown Workshop, girl, come through, we will save yeah. space for you. Um, but yeah, the uh, one of the really cool things about the residency is there will be something for everybody. So all ages, all different backgrounds, lifestyles, you don't have to be a quote unquote art or fashion person. Um, I encourage everybody to come. It's gonna be yeah. great. And um... Going back a little bit, so you live in Cincinnati, but you were on Project Runway, which I love. Um, I haven't watched it in a while, but I love Project Runway. Tell us about that experience. Oh, wow. Okay. So I went on Project Runway under the gun, um, pretty much right out of graduating from college. And then I was on um, a couple seasons ago of Project Runway All Stars. So whenever people ask me about that, I could do a full TED talk on it. So I'll try to condense my experience. But um, I always say it was like the best of times and the worst of times. Um, and the biggest like takeaway outside of the amazing people that I've met, like lifelong friends that I will have forever. Mondo and Sam specifically. Um, but it really was one of those pressure makes diamonds kind of situations. So I think more than anything, it gave me the reinforcement that I'm doing exactly what God put me here to do. Um, going on a show like that, honestly, is it's pretty much torture, like mentally, physically, it's draining, you get pretty much no sleep. Um, and it's way worse than what it looks like on TV. So you think that those uh, challenges happen every week, they really happen back to back to back with like barely any off days. Um, and it's a lot, it takes a huge toll on you. That's why people freak out and have meltdowns and act a fool on TV. Yeah. But when I went on, I was like, I'm not gonna embarrass my parents. Like that was, <laughs> that was the one thing is like, I will not embarrass Pam and Charles. Yeah. Um, so, so I actually was able to keep my cool, but, um, but yeah, the experience showed me that I'm really one tough chick and there's pretty much nothing you can throw my way that I can't figure out and make into gold, so. I love that, I love that so much. So are some of your pieces being shown um, at an exhibit as well at Taft, right? Yeah, so this is, I mean, honestly, 2021 has been divine timing, even though it's coming off of like this crazy, horrible year, right? Um, so it just so happened that the Walk This Way exhibit was coming to the Taft Art Museum. Um, it's there now. And when I got the residency, um, I was asked if I wanted to display some of my pieces. I'm like, duh, absolutely. 
<laughs> that's definitely been on my bucket list. And I'm thinking maybe when I'm old, almost dead, some of my stuff will be in a museum. So for me to be 33 and have that dream realized, it's been a huge blessing. So yes, please, please, please go down to the Taft Art Museum um, and check out my pieces that I have down there. Um, my good friend who is, does a lot of styling work for me and jewelry design for me, Julieta Ladipo, her pieces are also there. And it's just like, just such a like divine timing. There's nothing else that I could say to describe it, but perfect timing that that exhibit lined up with my residency. So yeah, go check it out. And how long um, is it down there for? Oh man, um, I think it'll be there for like through the summer. Don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, it'll be there past my residency, but I'm not exactly sure of the end date. Okay, I think I saw June or something maybe. Okay, um, that sounds so, correct. Yeah, so everyone listening, just make sure that you visit the TAF Museum website, visit their social media. I'm sure all the information is on there. I'm sure the Herald will put out something as well. Um, so you're in Cincinnati, it's, it's a pandemic, you're flourishing, which I love, you know, um, and I'm sure you get asked this question because I get asked this question. It seems as if you know, Black women who are flourishing in their craft, in their businesses, in their entrepreneurships, I always get asked, so when are you leaving Cincinnati? And I'm like, huh? You know, oh, like, God. I'm sure you get that all the time. Like, why aren't you in New York? Why aren't you in LA? Um, so, you know, what's next for you? Do you feel like you're going to stay here? Is there opportunity here? I want to hear your opinion on this. Yeah, so actually when people ask me that, I'm always like, you must not know that Cincinnati is the queen city. Hello, Hello. it's for Queens, okay? Um, but no, honestly, I've kind of always been a little bit of a nomad. So I've lived like in many different places across America. Um, and it's funny because I think that people who live in Cincinnati and haven't really ventured far outside of Cincinnati, seem to really think that Cincinnati just isn't that great. And when you've been, like I've lived in New York throughout my twenties um, and I've lived in LA and I've lived all other random places across America. Um, but I actually really love Cincinnati. Like I love the city. Um, it's that perfect mix of big city, but also like has that home feel. Um, and I'm never someone who's gonna say I'm here forever or I'm gonna move in this many years. I kind of just, go where I feel like God takes me as corny as that might sound mm -hmm. um so for now I'm here and we shall see I might I might stay I might go but um right now I'm here and I'm really happy and um can't be more grateful for being here during the pandemic when all of this popped off because I have been able to actually flourish and I think I'm at the right place in the right moment yeah and let's also note that the cost of living is low hello okay hello <laughs> <laughs> like I always tell people like Cincinnati is home base but mm -hmm. you know especially now like you can work from anywhere especially with what I do so I absolutely understand that I'm like why go somewhere and pay all this rent all this money when I can just stay there for a little while and be like okay I'm going back home now so Girl, I could I tell you the ratchet living situations I've had in New York specifically like I could write a book on it okay <laughs> I'm sure and maybe you should. Have you ever thought of like writing a book about your journey as, you know, a fashion designer from Cincinnati? Yeah, you know, I always say that when I get older, I'm going to write several books. Um, definitely detailing my journey in the fashion industry and um, and like really a lot of my work and I know I keep saying this but it all goes back to black identity and like knowing who you are so I definitely think I have some gems that one day I will put into a book um, but yeah not not just quite yet I got some more learning and growing to do I love that I love that so what else do you want to share with the Herald audience anything else that you can um, I know, I'm sure you have something else brewing, working. Um, what, what, what else is going on? Oh, I do, but I'm not allowed to speak on it yet because <laughs> it hasn't like, it, I haven't gotten the final yes on it yet. So I, I cannot speak on that. But right now, what I'm really trying to focus on is the residency. And then hopefully once I get past that and this other thing happens, I will let you know about it. But yeah. don't want to speak it yet because I don't, I, it's, it's still a question mark. No, well, you know, I'm going to speak life over you because I can't wait 
to see you in my favorite department stores like Saks and even Marcus, honey. I can't wait. I know it's coming. I can feel it. And then maybe a Target special collaboration. Okay, um, yeah. I'm speaking it over you. And so when they do, you know what influencer to pick to wear your stuff. I'm just saying, hint, hint, drop, drop. Um, yeah, I, I got will, you. I will rock it in, in um, my duster that I've been waiting on for years. And that is my dog in the back, y'all. So I apologize <laughs> for that. <laughs> it's all good. No, I got you. And I appreciate that, Morgan. I, I am long overdue to make you something. So we, you owe me that drink and girls night and I will figure something out for you. Yes, I'm ready. Well, please tell everyone how they can follow you, how they can support you, your social media, everything. Yeah, so my Instagram is Asha Ama, and you spell it A-S-H-A underscore A-M-A. And my website is really easy. It's ashaama.com, A-S-H-A-A-M-A dot com. Um, John, how much time do we have? Are we good? You need more? No, we are we are good actually, and I have to say that was a fascinating discussion. Yeah. Uh, so I want to thank all my guests for uh, coming on today. Thank you guys so much. Yes, perfect. Thank you. This is amazing. I appreciate you all. Thank you so much for having us. It was amazing to hear that conversation. I was looking up Asha up like during the conversation, and uh, I was amazed. Asha, you are like really famous. <laughs> <laughs> thank you girl but thank you so much i appreciate it i mean there is no publication that has left her yet like you are covered by ev covered by everyone and i'm so happy that to have you here that is so kind i appreciate you that literally made my day girl this week was a little questionable so thank you so much that's very sweet all right well thank you everybody thank you guys uh, bye you. have a good night love. And before y'all and before y'all go, I just want to make sure like everyone checks out all the stories we talked about today. Make sure you can check it out on our website, www.thecincinnatiherald.com. Make sure to check out our print edition. Make sure to check it out at Kroger, UDF, Walgreens, Joseph Beth Booksellers, and at select service stations. And make sure to follow us at the Cincinnati Herald on Facebook. Follow us at Cincy Herald on Twitter, Instagram. Follow us on YouTube at The Herald TV. And we've got a TikTok channel, y'all. So make sure you follow us on TikTok at The Cincinnati Herald. I am John Alexander Reese, digital editor of The Cincinnati Herald. And everyone have a good day. Bye.